Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. This is a familiar story, but I want to, I think the application will be refreshing to us again today. So Matthew 14, beginning in verse 28. Jacob, good job on reading the scripture this morning. Didn't he do a good job? Yeah. And I discovered first service, Sissa could play the flute. I didn't know that either. So thank you, Sissa. That was amazing. So here we read, Peter said to him, this is Matthew 14, 28. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. We're going to witness an amazing situa- scene here. Your kids can learn more about this if they come to VBS this week. Because our theme is miracles on the sea. We're talking about the Sea of Galilee. They're going to learn these stories. In verse 29, he said, Jesus said, come. Now, if you've ever walked on water as a kid, you realize it doesn't work. No matter how fast you run, you're not running across the water. Works about as well as you grabbing an umbrella, climbing on the top of your barn and jumping off and thinking you're going to float gently down to the ground. Doesn't work, does it? You're going to sink. It's the law of gravity. But for some reason in this situation, Peter decides that he wants to walk on water. We're going to talk about why here in a few minutes. And so Jesus says, come. Now, does everything stay normal when you decide you're going to follow Christ? Does your life, do you start to see things a little differently? When I became a Christian, I I remember distinctly the first time I saw downtown Missoula after becoming a Christian. Because downtown Missoula had a lot of bars and you'd see the the college kids migrate from one bar to the next. And a few weeks earlier, I was in that migration. But now as a Christian, I'm looking at that scene and it looks so dark to me and the dear people that were going from bar to bar seemed so aimless to me. Now that I'd become a Christian and I started to change the way I saw things, I started to hang out in strange places like churches. Started to hang out with people who talked faith. Talked about their God who could do for them things they could not do for themselves. Faith rewrites our future, would you agree? Now, if there was an enemy to faith, what would it be? It would be doubt. Doubts are always an enemy to faith. A doubt can rewrite a person's future as well, wouldn't you agree? A fear to do something that God's calling you to do, you decide not to do it, that alters history. So Jesus was standing on the water. Peter recognized that it was Jesus. At first, they were all completely frightened out of their skins. It says they were crying out when they saw Jesus because they thought he was what? A ghost. Anybody here ever seen a ghost? Good. <laughs> so you can imagine as, P, as, as, as Jesus is out there, Peter recognizes it's Jesus and now he decides he wants to go out on the water. Verse 14, or verse 28, it says, Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now the wind was tossing the boat all around. Peter was familiar with storms. He was a professional fisherman. He could probably floss his teeth in a, in a storm. But he he wasn't used to walking on water. And so you find this situation where Peter climbs out the boat and as he's walking across the water at some point, he must have thought to himself, what in the world did I get myself into here? As he starts to doubt, things change. Verse 30, but seeing the what? What did he see? He saw the wind the storm, the, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. 
So what shifted Peter's attitude? Well, we could say it was the wind that did it. But just a, even just a moment before, what do you say? Lord, if that's you, call me to come to you. So Jesus says, come. So he starts walking. And as he's walking, he starts to doubt because he starts to take his eyes off of God and he sees the wind. Now there's two mindsets. I want you to pay attention to this. There's, there's, two, there's a scale that we all balance on in our different areas of life. This scale is faith and doubts. And when your faith is strong and heavy, your doubts, they, they, they go away. And when your doubts are heavy, what happens to your faith? It goes away. It goes away. And so his faith begins to linger and wander. And in his doubting, he starts to sink. Now some of you here know what it's like to stand on the circular platform of the cliffhanger at Roaring Springs Water Park. You get in the, the capsule of death. And then they make sure you're ready. You give a, you're supposed to have your hands behind your head. And that's to keep you from flipping your head back and hitting the back of it when they drop the floor out from under you. It's a hydraulic drop. So it's like, as soon as they hit that, you hear it, and then your heart starts to, starts to drop as your body starts to drop. And from six stories up, you get to the bottom in three seconds. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> People pay to do that kind of stuff. So Peter, he's starting to drop. He's starting to sink. And he's feeling, he's feeling the water starting to consume his body, to come in his, and encircle his body. And here's what's interesting. Think about this for a second. What he could do before, he could no longer do because of doubt. Doubt actually shifted what he was able to do. And Peter shifted his focus from, what, from God's power to the problem. This happens in our life, doesn't it? Problem comes up, we can shift focus to circumstances, and as we sit, shift focus to circumstances, we can lose sight of who the great God of the universe is who has abundant resources and power to sustain us through whatever difficulty uh, according to his will. So we lose focus on the great God of the universe. And it's a big universe, right? It's very big. Two trillion galaxies now they're estimating. And as he's losing focus on, God, on Christ and focuses on the problem, what happens to his spirit? It starts to sink as well. He starts to get fearful and despairing. So if you have fear and despair in your life, what is present in your life that shouldn't be there? That fear and despair, where does it come from? In the faith journey, it's coming from doubt. The devil's trying to plant seeds of doubt in your mind. Has the devil done a good job at, at creating doubt in the minds of our culture regarding who Jesus is? Very much so. Doubts in the minds of even scholars regarding the historicity of the Bible. Places that are talked about in the Bible, they say it didn't exist. Thank you for archaeology. It's starting to show very clearly these places did exist. Amen. So if you're sinking right now in your life, feeling a little overwhelmed, feeling like the skies are all gray, it's time to dig into where are the doubts in my life that are fueling this situation, this condition I'm in. 1949, anybody alive in 19... Don't raise your hand. Okay, you can raise your, raise your hand if you were born in 1949. Anybody here? Okay. Okay, good. Excellent. My mom, I think, was born. Oh, well, never mind. Scratch that. Edit that out. <laughs> she might watch this. Um, 1949, Florida. It was down in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, the flatland, right? Florida's for flatlanders. And sun bunnies, right? Flatlanders, it's a very flat state. And they're in St. Petersburg. And E.E. E. Cleveland, you heard that name, E.E. E. Cleveland. He was 
preaching an evangelistic series and it was coming to a close. And he got a phone call from one of the ladies that wanted to be baptized. And she said to him, my, my, my husband has threatened me and told me that if you get baptized tomorrow, I'm killing you and the preacher. So here he was the next day. They were in the, the church there in St. Petersburg. And, and he found as he was preaching to this group of people in the church, they had the windows wide open because it was hot. It was back in 1949. And he found himself as he's preaching, he sees the husband's red truck pull in and park in the parking lot. Well, is it just about the time of the appeal? And he just, you know, has anybody ever heard E.E. E. Cleveland give an appeal? I mean, he, his appeals are as long as my sermon. I mean, he, he will run it out. He'll run it to everybody make comes up just because they're tired. <laughs> I want to go home. Oh, he was a man of God. He, he truly was. So he's making this appeal, and pretty soon he starts to hear a siren off in the distance. And that siren got closer and closer and closer till he could hear it in the parking lot of the church. And that husband who drove up in that red pickup truck parked his truck for the last time. They took him in the ambulance and he was dead before he got to the hospital. He died of a heart attack. Does faith make a difference in our lives? What he told the wife was this. He said, he said have trust in God and, and let God protect you. She did the baptism. She made the commitment. And she was preserved. The husband, did doubts make a difference in his life? Did it change the course of his future? It did, absolutely. Faith and doubting are incompatible when it comes to our journey with God. And this is what I love about Jesus. You know, some of you get upset when somebody pulls out in front of you when you're driving. <laughs> yeah. You know, Jesus, I, I got to say this. this. This is a reflection of Jesus, but it was said to me. This is such a great story. Well, it's short, but it's really good. I'm not going to mention who it was, but I had to say something to somebody in this church that I was, I don't, I don't think it was a criticism, it was just like something I needed to tell them. And then I said to them in the email, the text or the email, um, it wasn't a real serious thing or I wouldn't email them that, something of that scope, but I said, I hope I didn't offend you. And they, they emailed me back, Troy, I couldn't be more, of, uh, he's, <laughs> this is so good. Troy, you couldn't offend me if you ran me over with a Mack truck. <laughs> That's humility, is it not? So that, that you could not get, you could not shake Jesus. Jesus was never anxious. Jesus was never biting his nails, right? You couldn't get Jesus anxious. So in the midst of a mob that hated him and were going to take him to Caiaphas, Jesus was perfectly calm at his trial in front of Pilate when the crowd was saying, crucify him. When they were saying that, was Jesus calm? Yes. Absolutely. You couldn't shake his peace. Why? Because he had a faith that the Father knew what he was doing, that the plan of salvation would work, and that he would see the fruit of his, of his labors and bring us to home, bring us to heaven. He had that, he knew the promise that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his what? Purpose. Purpose. So he knew that. So you couldn't shake that. Do we need that kind of faith in the world we live in today? Yes. Or do we have people fearful in California right now? Yes. How about in New Orleans? Yes. Yes. We have, I read a story of down, in, this one didn't even make the, I don't know if it made the headlines or not. In Mexico, you know, it's, it's summer down there, but Mexico is a little higher. Mexico City is a higher elevation. They had, in certain places, piles of hail that stacked up five feet. I kid you not. Google it. And, it, and when it started, when it melted, it created rivers in the streets. We hear about hurricanes. We hear about flooding. 
We hear about earthquakes, tornadoes. We're in a time in our lives where we've got to have more faith in what God can do. Because one of these days, your eyes will see Christ. Your eyes will see them. And you'll be like, I've been dreaming about this. Is this true? Is it real? He's coming. That's your, your faith will see that. Because it's very real. It's like if we went back 2,000 years, we could see Jesus walking through Jerusalem, teaching the people, healing the people. He had a complete, Jesus had complete confidence in the promises of the word. He had confidence in the truth. Faith has the strength to calm our nerves and bring peace to our souls and hope to our future. Paul had, I mean, Peter had a problem here in verse 30. He said, seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Now, I think there was a reason why Peter was so terrified. He was a seasoned fisherman. I'm sure he could swim well. He swam pretty well, it seems like, from the Bible when he saw Jesus after his resurrection, right? What did he do? He jumped off the boat. Are we getting our five out of seven days in? <laughs> Read a chapter, five out of seven. So he swims to shore, right? Peter can swim. So why is he so terrified? I, I think here's what I think was happening. I went, went on a mission trip to the Bahamas. It was terrible. I mean, we were really suffering there. It was a real sacrifice, let me tell you that. Um, on the way back from the Bahamas, we... The captain of, of this 24-foot yacht said, would you guys like to swim in the Gulf Stream? Anybody here swam in the Gulf Stream? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah. So he says, you want to swim in the Gulf Stream? He said, sure. So he cut the engine, so we're just floating. And then he took the raft, this, this life raft, and he, he tied the rope to it and threw it off the back of the boat. And I was thinking to myself, why is he doing that? Well, I found out real quickly why. When you jump in the Gulf Stream, there's a reality that you need to realize. A current will push a boat much faster than you swimming with your little old self in the big blue ocean. So as you're swimming in the ocean, that current is pushing that boat so fast away from you that you can't swim fast enough to catch the boat. So as, as Peter is in the water, in the, and the, what did he say? The winds were blowing hard. What's going to happen to the boat? The boat's going to be pushed faster than Peter can swim to catch it. And so he thinks, he knows, he knows that if Jesus doesn't save him, he's going to drown. He's too far to catch the boat, but he's close enough to Jesus for Jesus to hear him. And Jesus, out of his love, knows the need. Listen here, verse 31. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? We know today from reading the story, looking back on it, his eyes, the reason why he doubted was because his eyes were taken off of God, off of Jesus, and focused on the problem. The problem became bigger than God. Whenever we find a problem bigger than God, that we think is bigger than God, doubt sets in, and we also become fearful. Fearful of the future, fearful of our retirement, fearful of our health, could be fearful of relationships. Perfect love casts out fear. If Jesus is the captain and he's in the boat with me, I have nothing to fear. Though he slay me, David said, yet I will trust in him. Is your funeral the end of your story? Is your funeral the beginning of your story? 
Hallelujah. It's true. You can't argue with the grave, right? You can't talk your way out of death. We all know we have a destiny lest Jesus comes first. But what we need to find out is where the doubts are in our life that are creating the fear and replacing that with the truth. Our faith is to grab on and hang on to the truth. There was a 27-acre tomato farm. Clo- clovers were it was covered in, in blossoms. A farmer, his name was Jones, was looking at this field. This story is told in a great series of books um, that you may have. This is from volume 14 of Bedtime Stories. How many of you have heard Bedtime Stories? Man, are those good. Read those to your kids. Read them to your kids. Man, talk about instill faith in them. They're so interesting. So it's 27 acres of tomatoes, and it's worth about $4,000 at the time. He knows that this, it, this crop has to come through because it's all they have for, for income. And one morning, he's walking through his fields. He gets to one corner, and he recognizes a bitter enemy to tomato plants, and that is the army worm. He calls his wife over, and he says to his wife, look. She comes over and looks at these plants, and she sees the army worm, and she starts to despair. The kids kind of see something's happening. They come over, and dad says, we've got army worms. And he knows Within about three or four days, those army worms will move through and just eat everything on that crop. So he decides that he's going to talk a little doubt. What did I say? Doubt. He's going to speak doubt. But he has a daughter who's going to speak faith. All right. <laughs> So doubt was spoken by the dad, and he says, well, actually, first his child, Jamie, says, what are we going to do? We can never kill them all. See, I love how kids think, right? You see a worm, it's a problem. What do you do? You smash it, right? Problem is a lot of worms. So what are we going to do? And father father says, no, we can never kill them all. There are too many. And Mary said, we must ask Jesus for help. That was the daughter, the the young daughter. We must ask Jesus for help. And he says, perhaps we should, but what can he do for us in trouble like this? Mary said, "Um, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible, Father, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes? (laughs) Hallelujah for daughters. And he just kind of blew off the question. Perhaps we should, but it's pretty hopeless now. So Mary, not content with that answer, says, I'm going to go find that in the Bible. I'm going to go look it up. She's one of those girls that read at least a chapter a day, five out of seven days a week. She knew where was it at. And she brought the Bible back out and she said, she started reading it as Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that There may be meat in my house, and prove me now, herewith says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now the next verse is very key to their situation. Verse 11, Malachi 3, if you're taking notes, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. That was the promise. And she says, Daddy, you're you're returning a faithful tithe, aren't you? And he said, yeah. And she said, well, then we need to claim this promise. Then God will rebuke the devourer. They kneeled down as a family right there in the field, the daughter said, God must do what he says. And they began to pray. And one of the, one of the statements made there was rebuke to devour and save our tomato fields. And shortly after praying that prayer, a blackbird appeared. 
Then came another one. Pretty soon there was a dozen blackbirds in the corner of that field. A dozen turned into a hundred, and a hundred turned into about a thousand because they said they, as those birds finished their lunch, that problem was a bird's lunch. <laughs> As they finished their lunch, it says it looked like the sky turned dark as that, that flock of, of blackbirds flew off into the horizon. And they went over there and they looked at where they saw those worms coming out and there wasn't a worm in the crop. They harvested all those tomatoes based on the promise of God. You will never be disappointed in heaven that you exercised faith on earth. Never. Things may not turn out the way you want them to down here, but when you get to heaven, you'll say, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for not answering my prayer that I would marry that guy or gal. Thank you that I didn't get that job that I wanted so bad. See, in heaven, what we're going to find is the reality that everything we didn't see here is, is everyday occurrence there. The angels we don't see here, we will see walking and flying in heaven. Do you agree? Yes. Now, there's one thing that will actually keep us on a faith journey, and only one. And Peter got this right. They were very fearful in the boat. They thought Jesus was a ghost. He, he, he responded by saying, peace to you. Be not afraid, it is I. There was one thing that got Peter out of the boat. Peter was not interested in walking in, on water. That's not why Peter got out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat because he wanted to be with Jesus. And the only thing that will keep you in a faith journey in the days and years, months ahead, is your desire to be with Jesus. In fact, the prayer that we prayed last week was, Lord, give me a fascination with Jesus. Jesus has to become center to our lives so that we don't function in a world where Jesus is the side note and, the, and our, our life is the main body of work Jesus is the main body of work and the things we do is just a side note. He that has the Son has life. One day our faith will lift us off this planet. Can I get an amen? She was given an amen. One day our faith will walk through the prayer of the gates. There's 12 of them. One day, we'll live in a world where there's no problems, none. One day, we'll live in a world where there's no violence. There's no refugees fleeing for their lives from a country or countries that are products of bad leadership. One day, we'll see a world without strife and violence one day we'll see this earth made new. There'll be a monument right in this spot, little tiny one that says where the Cloverdites used to worship. <laughs> be a beautiful garden. And then it'll also say as a footnote, five out of seven. <laughs> one day our faith will ask us the question, why did I doubt God? Why did I doubt him? He's absolutely and completely trustworthy. Let's live what he promises. Let's trust what he promises. He'll provide for us. Whatever it looks like, he is with us. He will do what's best for us. And one day when we get to heaven, and we're sipping kiwi juice, we're going to be so thankful that we exercise the faith he deposited in each of our lives. And the more you live your faith, the stronger your faith 
becomes. And the more you push out doubt, the weaker the doubt becomes. And the more you think about Christ, the more beautiful Jesus becomes. So I want you to examine your life and figure out what doubts are eating your crop of faith. What doubts do you need to pull out and replace with the truth, the promises of the word? I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. You know, one day, look at your hand. Look at your right hand. One day, of course, your hand will be remade. You're going to be holding Jesus' hand. Your hand is going to hold Jesus' hand. Won't that be an amazing reality? He's going to walk you down the side of the river bank. And he's going to talk to you with the tenderest voice. And when that talk is done, you're going to say, Jesus, do you have to let go of my hand? Can't we walk a little further? And he'll say, daughter, son, we got eternity to talk. For now, I got to go. But remember, you're loved always. And in heaven, we'll never question it. You can exercise that faith in this song. You, don't, you may not know the song. But the words of the song are expressing faith. You can have it as a prayer to God today. There's only one place in all the Bible where God sings over us. It was referred to in our, our children's story that Ben did such a good job on, Zephaniah. It's the only place in the Bible where God sings over us. Let's sing over God at this moment. Let's sing faith as we stand for closing song. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Most beautiful name in all of the universe. Thank you for loving us enough to sacrifice him on a brutal cross in front of a despicable crowd. All because you love us and want us to be redeemed. Lord, we know Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's conquered the grave. He's conquered this world. The devil is a defeated foe. We are marching to Zion, Lord. Because we have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. May we find ourselves speaking faith. May we squash the doubts the devil whispers in our ears. May we find them having no value whatsoever in our lives. May we find ourselves fascinated with Jesus. And Lord, may every single soul in this church be preparing for our great and wonderful flight to the new world. Let us live our faith and squash the doubts through your truth. Thank you for loving us and thank you for this time to worship together. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.